Jignesh, how are you? Hi, Saurabh. Hi, Dan. I'm fine. Okay. Hello. Okay. So, continuing what we were discussing before starting recording, uh, there was one interesting change that I found in this release, which kind of, uh, and I have said it so many times, which made me believe that this is the direction that Microsoft should be going, and it seems they are going that route. So when you look at the country region expansion in this release, uh, 2023 release wave one, there's one interesting update, which is about the Swedish localization. So like Dan will understand it. And Ignesh, I guess if you only work for an Indian customer, you might not, but uh, there were some countries where Microsoft uh, released Business Central with their localization as part of base app, which are, let's say, North America, Swedish, US, Canada, all these countries have uh, the base app with their localization. Whereas there are countries like India, uh, Pakistan, and other countries which are being recently added, all these countries, uh, their localization is actually a separate extension. So in this release, Microsoft uh, broke or kind of splitted the Swedish localization extension as a separate extension than the base app. And I'll be surprised, uh, I'll not be surprised if they continue doing that with other localization. So like in future, like let me open my sandbox to kind of explain you what I'm saying. So this is US. <laughs> When you go into the extension management, uh, it just says base app and system app and application, which are these, where is the base app? The system app, which is surely there. Um, base app. So the base app is a collection of W1 or a combination of W1 and US in this environment. Hey, hey Shrava. Yeah. I, I don't see anything you're sharing. Oh, again. Sorry for that. It's okay. I just. Uh, <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't know why this does not work. This Microsoft did make some changes on this Teams. And I guess that's where it become a little bit confusing. Can you see the. Yeah, the we see it now. It? Yeah, yeah, we can All see right. it now. So here is the update which I was talking about. And I guess I was only talking to myself till then. So the Swedish localization will now be an extension, which is a separate extension. And what I was showing here in, and this is the US localization, or oh, sorry, the US sandbox environment. In this environment, the base application is a combination of uh, a W1 base app plus US localization. So this is the first time that Microsoft have kind of splitted the localization part into a separate extension, which is great. And I'll not be surprised if they keep doing it with other localization that they release as part of the base app. The, the initial benefit of moving toward this direction is that Microsoft can continuously focus on the base app, which is more or less W1 base app to add features. Whereas this localization, uh, are handled by partners because that's what is happening in rest of the uh, releases. If you pick any of those like Bahamas, let's see, you'll notice that this is done by partner-led localization. So all these localization are built by partners, including India and other countries. And that's good in two sense. One, the local partner understand the local regulations and features. Second, it put Microsoft back in focus with enhancing the base app or W1 base app so that the enhancement can, can come quicker and they don't have to keep looking and updating these local features in the product. So, and I'll not be surprised, and I'm, I, I keep saying this, that in future, uh, somehow Microsoft is able to say, okay, if you have two countries, 
uh, where you operate or if you have five different countries, you install that extension on top of this base app from W1 and run through it. I know it's not possible as of this moment because of uh, complexity and overlapping events that need to be called. But I always believe that this is the direction that Microsoft is going. And maybe I'm true, I don't know. But that'll be interesting if that happens in future. So yes, this is what we were talking about before starting recording. The another thing that we were talking about, and let's go there, which is Business Central App Source. If you haven't read or uh, watched the Microsoft uh, launch event where they did talk about different things, one of the interesting thing that they added here is that Freddie added a free app, I guess, not a free app, but a demo app. Should not call it free app, more or less. Okay, I misspelled it then. So, okay, we are on Dynamics 365 Business Central. We should see at least one app from Freddie, if I'm not wrong. And that app is, or maybe I need to search it from, oh, here. Oh, now there are two. Called Hello World 3. Now, if you have customers on SaaS, they will see a button like this now, which is buy now. So this is what Microsoft have started in this release where you can actually use Microsoft engine to kind of sell your services and you can show your different plans and pricing based on uh, whatever your app is and whatever you are offering to your customers and different price. You can list them directly here in the app section and then other tabs remain as it is. When you get into buying this app, uh, it tells you about which offer you want to pick, uh, like this free trial, and then pricing for one month is this, for one year is this, and then number of users that will support of this, and then different pricing. Let's try it next and see what happens. Uh, let's see gold. So here you can pay directly by credit cards, I guess. Yeah, these are credit cards and all. And then you can define how many users you would like to use for. Uh, do you want to enable the recurring billing or not? Uh, is it for a month or a year? And then you get different prices based on that if you have. And then once you move next, you come to this page where it's the payment page where you say how much you will be paying if you do this. And then once you do, and place order, it actually goes ahead and places the order for you. Till now, if I'm not wrong, uh, there are third party uh, services that you have to use while you trying to sell from your app source app. So that kind of bakes in in this version. And I don't know what this is. Let's look at it. Convert temperature. Sample app for adding page and convert Celsius to temperature. This is a sample app adding a page. What does that do? It's enabled for this sample app, but there is no support for this app. Hmm. Oh, so this is a free app. No, it's not free app. There's a free trial for it. And then, oh, again, okay. this is again an example of a sample uh, app with the with the payment options and all so do try it out let's see how much it is i don't know about the you know the channel fees that you'll have to pay to microsoft to enable this but now that's an option so if you are an app uh, partner who build apps you surely would like to check how much this costs versus how much the third party cost Okay, so we did talk about what's new in the product with respect to the functionalities because we were looking at the preview releases in the past. Now, let's talk about some of the dev changes that are there. 
the one important one where people have used third party tools like a uh, what was that object designer or easier tool to get the object designer microsoft came up with something called as al explorer so without having any custom extension you can have microsoft extension or it's part of the vs code now you don't have to i'm sure i don't have to install any third party extension for it yes i don't have to it's just part of the vs code update where you just search for al explorer and that brings you the old or the known object designer with some new features into it so like you see all the objects here which are part of the apps which you have dependency to which means by default all the microsoft apps uh, the base app and the system app for sure whatever are listed on your default dependencies and the app that you are building uh so here you see all then in the modules you can select whatever you have bookmarked so you can actually if you're working on five different objects you can actually uh bookmark some of the objects so i can say oh for some reason i'm working on ach so i'll go ahead and bookmark these and then at the time whenever i start my work i can keep focus on these objects rather than the whole big list of objects that's there then you can see whatever is in your current project which is this project where there's some tables pages reports whatever objects you have if you have multiple apps uh, in a workspace setting then it'll also show you whatever is your workspace, which means if you have multiple apps, so it'll show you all those apps source over here, objects here. If you have dependencies, then it'll show you all those dependencies, like in this case, base app, system app, and system application. So I can just filter out on those and see all the objects in there. Then, uh this is on the modules that we see then in the group you can do a group by type as we always do based on object types you can uh, group your different objects so let's see base app so all these objects now group by uh, type and shorted based on names you can surely short it on numbers and that becomes your old legacy object designer uh, you can group by modules. So now here, what Microsoft have done, if you look at the base app, they started creating different modules in the app. And that then, this is modules in case if you are looking at all. And it shows you different modules, which are different apps. And then you can see the objects inside there. Or you can see related tables. Now the concept of related table comes from how Microsoft is placing those files in the base app folder or system app folder. So let's let me quickly find where my system app is and I'll show you what I mean by that. And I think that's related to that. So let me see if I have a DVD extract somewhere. It seems no. So let me try that. Oh. Okay. Folder. Okay. Let me bring this into my main screen and let me just copy here. Hmm. Okay, so once you have the DVD and I, I normally have the system app and base app extracted. Maybe I, because I was trying to install BC22, I removed it. So while this is happening, one more interesting thing that somebody pinged me today is about the on-prem product DVD. So for some reason, and I have no clue why this is done, but Microsoft have removed the file where it was. 
and I'm not able to find the actual file of the central 22 on premise at this point. So here is somebody commented today about when you go and try to download the on prem product, it ends up to a unknown path. It says it is not working. This download is no longer available. And if you remember in the last week, Microsoft also rolled back updates from Business Simple SaaS. So I'm not sure what's happening, but for sure right now, if you try to download the on-prem DVD for Business Central 2022, that kind of fails at this moment. And it is not just my link. I did went to other uh, bloggers who did post about the release. And to my surprise, none of the links are working right now for downloading to the central 22 at this moment. So keep an eye on that. If you are trying to kind of sell business central 2022 right now, it's not yet ready. Maybe this links get updated in a while or be available in future. So once that happens, we'll have a look into it. Okay, so it's happening. Let me open the smallest and the best app that we have seen. It's the system app. Okay, this is the app which I like. The way Microsoft is building it, it's super interesting. Because what they have done, and let me open this in VS Code so that it makes sense. Okay, it's still extracting, I guess. Good, there is a lot of this. And this is the app that everyone should prefer and try to keep up to date on this app because this is where the cool stuff is from everything in Business Central that you find cool is available within this app. So all the source code is available on your product DVD or on your Docker environment if you're using Docker. And you can just refer this app for some of the cool features in Business Central. So like if you are dealing with Azure AD, there are different kind of examples and methods available here, which can be referred. If you are dealing with base 64 or blob or cryptography, like we talked about last time, which kind of failed what you are trying, the data archiving feature in the central, uh, edit in Excel, emailing, all these are kind of grouped, which is good. Like when you look at the base app, it looks a little bit uh, scattered here and there, but the system app is shorted. So if you look at it, this is how it is, the system app. And these have different folders and have a specific objects in that area. So if I'm trying to do something on base 64, I'll surely refer this. And they are done in a way that there is a public access code unit and then there is a more or less private access or internal access which means I cannot call any methods in this code unit but then there is a layer on top of it which is this public code unit which gives me access to that private code unit so the implementation is inside this which you cannot refer while uh, utilizing this app as a dependency but you can access this public code unit and utilize all these methods and there is good documentation about it every method every parameter has a definition why it's needed what it does and things like that so i'll highly encourage if you are dealing with barcodes here is a whole set of code unit and objects inside this which will tell you about different barcode provider that microsoft supports on-prem uh, sorry SAS which also means on-prem and how you can get a 2D barcode, 1D barcode, or you know, I'm pretty sure there is a QR code. But just remember that anytime you see an access internal, that means you are not allowed to use that method or use that object outside the base and the system app. But then there will be a uh, code unit for you, which will allow you to access this outside so as we were going back into it 
let's go back into the AL Explorer and you will see that based on these different folder structure that Microsoft have in system app, the AL Explorer also shows you that. So if I go back to my system app, I'll see all those folders here now directly. So if I'm learning or doing something on email account, I can see that these are the objects that I should be referring to or reading about. So that's how the related table group by works. And then the path is where they are stored again. So that again shows you uh, all the files in that particular folder more or less. <coughs> Sorry. Then you can surely search as you used to do. Uh, let's say customer and filter out anything that has a word customer. Or if you know the number, which is typically an app developer does, then type in the number and the search will support that. Now that was the object part. One thing that I forgot to talk about is let's look at the shorter list. If you are on a object which is runnable, you can actually run it from here and it'll directly populate or run your client based on your launch.json. So whatever you, your server is, you don't have to publish an app to see how a page look like or go out of your VS code and shift to a browser. You can just do a run and it'll populate your browser with that exact page. Uh, I'm sure about the table also. Yes, you can run the table and queries. You cannot run code units for sure. Then have everybody had certain kind of difficulties while trying to access source code. There's a button here to access source. So you can click on it and take you to the source code of that object. Now this button is dependent on uh, what the app provider has set to. So if you are dealing with an ISV, which haven't exposed the source code, to partners or anyone who is using their app, you will not be able to navigate to the source and that will remain as it is irrespective of either you are using AL Explorer or any other third party app to explore objects. So that remains as it is. I'll have to check one thing because uh, based on app.json, there are these three different policies. And I'll be interested to see how that impacts AL Explorer because it says, uh, can you, is the source code included in the symbol file? And how does that differ is when you use these tools to explore source code like object designer, what happens is if you don't have access to the source code, you can, not this one, I guess. It's a default one, I guess. Yes, so if you don't have access to the source code, uh, especially for the tables and code units, you can do a open symbol in new tab, which can at least give you the structure of that table. So this is kind of what fields that they have at what IDs, what is the key, uh, what are the different methods in that. I can't see what's written inside those, but I, I get a fair idea of what kind of events are there. What is the primary key of this table? What kind of field and what data type they have, which I'll have to review by installing an ISV to see how AL Explorer does that. Because I don't see an option to show me the field structure and all. I just have an option to see the source code, which will then take me to the object if it is allowed by the app provider. The another cool thing that they added here is events. So now you can just look for all the events available in the apps that you have. And again, in the same way, you can uh, short them out. So let's search for some. Can I search for object and will it filter out? I don't think so. Okay. I'm on the base app, so can I do a customer search if I have to? No, it's just doing it here. Okay. So these are the events uh, which are available. I okay. Here is something type. What is the type? 
table doesn't help modules nope okay it'll be great if microsoft enhances this to at least have it based on objects so if i'm looking for events on table purchase header they all are visible at one place do you think that will help i think that's one of the common thing that i i face sometimes because in this list it'll be a little bit hard to find out until unless you can i multi shot it let me see no i cannot okay but once you find an event that you would like to use you can subscribe to it once you subscribe to that it create it copies to the clip clipboard uh, how a event subscriber should look like and then you can come to an object and inside a code unit uh, okay you can just directly paste it and it will is the way you should subscribe to it the right thing with this is that people sometimes get confused about these last two parameters and i don't know why some people set it to true once in a while and then they get confused or their code is a skipped when user processes something and then they are confused so with using this it will make sure that you are using the right parameters as they should be so if you don't know this these last two parameters are skip on missing license and skip on missing permission so if you set it to true then user will never uh, get an error message if he or she does not have the permission or if it is not in the license it will just skip it that subscriber so if you have done it true some in some projects make sure and go and update it because this is we have seen it in some customers where these are true which may be just because of how people think about it but the beauty or the right way of subscribing is to make sure that at least those last two parameters are set to false so right so try to sub yeah do you think uh, there might be a use case where these needs to be set as true let's talk about that what would be those situation because if you are subscribing to a event you surely want to execute that code when user does something right yeah yes if you set them to true and user does not have permission or they don't have the license then that behavior or whatever the code that you have written in subscriber will be just skipped straight forward and user will not get an error message about it mm -hmm. the only time that i think we you will be able to utilize it if you are selling your app in oh, a model God. based as an in a different pricing area section you know if you say that oh yeah. if you are using basic then this subscriber will be called otherwise this will not be yeah. and that is based on the first parameter which is skip on missing license because i don't think that you should be able to do you should be doing skip on missing permission because if you don't have permission then why you as a user are even touching on that area so let's say if i don't have permission to utilize purchases and then i'm executing a process which let's say post purchase orders mm. then i should not be able to access that whole area not just the subscribers exactly right i'm pretty sure if these booleans are added there will be a business case for it and uh, the first one makes sense in certain areas based on how you're selling your app second one i'll have to think about it because yes if there are no scenarios why these two booleans will be added but yeah, in, because in a tip so far i haven't found right? any yeah you always set this to false 
Yeah, because in a typical PT uh, environment where you are writing customizations for your customer, yep. then for sure these should be set to false. But maybe there are scenarios in an app-based situation where you would like to set them to true. Mm-hmm. You'll have to figure yeah. that out, I guess. I haven't dealt with that yet. Okay. So we've seen events, then APIs, uh, something that uh, used pretty extensively right now uh, in Business Central by different developers. And this just list API, and you might be thinking why there is a small set of API, because the API apps are separate apps in, in Business Central. Those are not part of the base app. So when you look at the system app or the, the base, the apps that are available from Microsoft in on-premise environment and even on SaaS. Uh, there are these apps called Exclude, I guess, APIs or what they call Yeah, it. the API version one and two. Yeah. Oh, I'm in system application, my bad. So API version yes. one and two are the two apps which are separate. So if you would like to see their objects, you will have to take a dependencies on those in your extension, and then you'll be able to see those. I'm hoping so. And because there are modules, so I'm pretty sure that when you add the dependencies of these apps here, you'll be able to see those dependencies uh, here or APIs here. What you can do from here, you can just again see the source code of those APIs, which will then allow you to see that. Extensible enums because enums are being used in different areas of business central. The only problem is that there are some which are uh, which you cannot extend, but there are some which can be extended. Now I'm surprised that it only shows me these. What about my sales line type extension? That should be part of base app. Hmm. That's weird. Let me see enums. And if I look for line type, sales line type enum, this is extensible, but why I don't see it here? Hmm. What? are these why it is not visible oh so these are enums which are extended sorry okay so i was reading it wrong this shows you enums which are already extended either by your app or by base app so the base app is also extending some of the enums and this is just listing enums that are extended no this is an implementation of enum. What is this one? Again, implementation. Okay, so this is in support of interfaces. So when you are building interfaces, eventually you will have to extend an enum. And this is only listing enums which are related to interfaces to see which of these enums can be extended. If there are enums which cannot be extended and which are related to interface, those are only visible here. So if you are into uh, interfaces where you are modifying things, then you can get the list of enums that you can extend to support or to extend that interface altogether. Okay, what else for developers? Um, along with AL Explorer, there is something called as AL Home, which is a home for business center news. I'm pretty sure it's only getting news from Microsoft at this moment, but any new announcement for developers, Microsoft will make sure that this page gets updated and you can surely set it to startup. So anytime you open your VS code you will see your AL home where you'll get all the updates in with respect to business central for developers only, what has been changing, how they are doing it. So 
So you'll be able to see all these details here. And I guess right now it's showing the AL Explorer here as one of the news. So let's see what comes up in this area, but I would surely use it as a startup and see how things go and what updates we get from Microsoft about it. Extensible enums. These are all the enums which are extensible and that implement in an interface. Okay. So as I was saying, it is only showing those enums which are extensible, but also related to an interface. If they are not, then they will not be visible in that list. Okay, what else? Okay, one thing that will may impact every developer at this moment, uh, they have slightly changed how you define your event subscriber. So before I show you, let me go back to is it in? Yes. So if I try to subscribe to an event on a page with my business central 21, if I say page, page, and let's say customer card, and the event that I would like to subscribe to is to validate, which also means that I need to define the field that I want to do it. And if I do a, let's say address two, this is a subscriber in Business Central 21 or till Business Central 21. Nothing changes till the point you don't change your app.json, which you should be if you would like to customize a behavior of a new feature that's available in 2022, uh, 2023 release wave one. And if you would like to your customers to use the latest platform enhancements that are there. What happens with that is Microsoft have slightly changed how these fields are being placed. And so if I now try to subscribe to this event, the same event, and as a page, and this becomes my page. Again, the customer card. And same event on after. So I cannot. Reason is they have removed these spaces, and I can now say on after validate you. If I try to search the field here which I have done all these years, I cannot. I don't get confused if you see something like this. You'll have to start removing these single quotes and then search for your feed. Come on. Okay. That surely slows down the process. Is it waiting for these to be updated? It should not. But okay. Address two. So the single quotes on the field name are converted to double quotes only if there is a space in the name. So let me try this. Uh, I cannot now. I have changed this. Uh, but if I try to utilize a field where there are no spaces, which is, is none, I guess. Every field has some space. Email still does that. Okay. Is there no field without space? That's weird. Or spatial character because that's again parts of double quotes. But okay, I guess you get the intent. It these single quotes will be converted to double quotes, and uh, that's the change in how you define your different events. Now there can be thousands of events that you have subscribed in your apps, and it might sound a lot of work, but I guess Microsoft understand that. And what they have done is you click on it, you get a light bulb here, 
which gives you action to convert the argument to a literal to identifier on this instance, which is where you are right now, or on all the occurrence in this particular document, which is this page. The third one is on what is this? In the workspace and in the project. So you can just do it in one click on throughout your project. So if I do it on this instance only, this will convert this to a literal. Same here, when you click on the single code one, you can apply the same rule and apply it to your project, your workspace, or your current object, and it'll just change it there. If I bring it back, and this time, because I also have an event here, if I do it on all occurrence of the document, it should convert that also. Not a change, not something where you have to spend hours into it, but make sure to keep that in mind because eventually I hope that it may break in starting in future. It's not breaking right now if you're old, if you're using the old style. The benefit of it is that then it allows you the typical value situation as in you can from here directly go into where that event is or to that particular field which you are trying to subscribe to so then it brings down the business central capabilities of uh, go to definition which then takes you exactly at that field or at that event which you are subscribing to so to address that Microsoft have to change the behavior of how even are subscribed. And with that change, it'll help you to kind of navigate to the right area. The other thing that I read is about it tells you about how many uh, places your event has subscribed to, which doesn't make much sense to me at this moment because I cannot see where all Microsoft event has subscribed. But if I write a custom event, let's write one in one of my code unit. Let's say the, uh, this okay, the event sub. Oh, sorry. The event integration. Uh, Results. And this is my dummy event. And I'm passing what I'm passing. I'm passing sales line. Let's see. Let's pass this. The first thing that I'll have to do is somewhere I'll have to define that this event is being called. Okay. So wherever the code reaches to this point will invoke my event. As soon as this event is created, now you see a one reference here, but then if I create one more code unit, and if I try to subscribe to that event, which I've just created, code unit and the code unit is called take error, nice name, take error and then I'll do these false. This one also false. And find the element name. And then here, oh, I forget. I'll use this dummy event. As soon as the subscriber is called, you will see that on the event publisher, you see that it has been used two places. The only problem is to me when I look at this and try to understand this feature is this will only help developers to see that they defined the event, but did they called it or not? Because if you are taking this app and uh, adding this to your dependency, I'll not be able to see how many times you are referring to this. Because that's something that, that surely will help me. And then here you can also see find all references, as it is, as it works in other areas. Is there a situation where you think it's useful other than finding out in my app where I'm subscribing to my event? Which is a case for apps in some time. 
but not always. Okay, so what else? Um, on the pages, what they have done, let's try to create a page. So 100, and this is sample. And let's add to the customer table. Let's try to build a legacy page scenario where I'll just add fields using AZAL extension. Add multiple fields. What happened? Okay, come on. Okay. Let me add some fields randomly. Click OK. And then surely in the past, because the application area was kind of mandatory, you would have set it to application areas on each and every field that you have in your page. And let's set this up on all these page fields. It's kind of pretty hard to read when you know that it is not required and maybe in this field it's basic. Just assuming that because you can have application area at the field level. Now with the previous release what Microsoft did uh, said that application area is not mandatory on the field level if you have already defined it on the page level. And it will automatically inherit the application area. The field will automatically inherit the application area which is defined at the page level it also works with the page extension but i highly encourage you to keep using the application area on the page extension because in the base microsoft page it might not be set to application area all so like if you look at uh, let's say items page if you look at the application should not go into item card. That's my bad. Let's go to item list. The application area on this page is set to basic suite assembly and service. It is not set to all. So when you are using page extension, make sure that you still use application area all in the fields that you're creating. But if you have new pages, where you have set application area all, and then it's being repeated on all the field. Just for the cleanup, what Microsoft have done, they have added again an action here to remove the redundant application area property. You just do the cleanup of your objects and remove wherever it is set to application area all. But you keep in mind that anywhere where it is not all, it will not change that. It will respect that. So if I do this, it should go ahead and start and have removed all application area other than this. So if you have a big app where you have to do a lot of reading and you know it kind of adds time into reading that, make sure to clean up your apps by just using this new action from Microsoft here. But as I was saying earlier, remember if you are someone who are developing or helping a team who does this, don't utilize this rule on page extensions only use it on new pages that you're building because it will uh as we saw it doesn't work in the same way it in it will inherit every field of your page extension will inherit this application area if you are extending item list rather than utilizing application area all which i'm pretty sure you want that so use that wisely in case of page versus page extensions. But do clear up your fields that you have. The, what else? Enums, what they have done on enums. Okay, let's try to do an enum extension. Uh, so get a 100 and extend sales line type. As for Microsoft, the IntelliSense now should suggest me what is what should be my NM ID or NM index at that point, which is very important because I have seen people utilizing five or seven or ten, which you should not, because eventually that's a range which is locked by Microsoft. Now, when the IntelliSense supports you, it does 
it based on whatever the object numbers that you have set on your app.json. So if you have set it to, let's say, 60,000, then it'll automatically suggest you 60,010 at this point. Which makes sense that your NM indexes are also set to the number that is in your range rather than on utilizing a Microsoft or uh, an ISV range, which is never suggested. So keep that in mind. That will help you. One update for on-prem before we end today's call is in here. And let me add a configuration because that kind of gets confusing sometimes. Here, on-prem server. Microsoft did add a new property, which is public URL from server, which is here. Let's add it here. Something like that. Use no, no, it's a public URL. Okay. No, it already being added. Uh, yes, here it is. Sorry, already added. Use public URL from server. Now, this is specifically on prem. So, what happens in on prem is there is a setting on prem where you have to define your instance public URL. Where you say, okay, anytime I would like to launch from my business central doing F5 or control F5 for debugging, uh, read that setting uh, on my uh, custom setting.config and based on that, try to connect to the server, which have very rigid structure where it can fail, where you have problems and all. Now, what you can do is you can set it to false which means once you set it to false, the system will try to connect to this server, which is the server that you have listed there, which will make it easier for developers when they are doing uh, publish from VS code or when they are debugging, because otherwise this kind of fails the whole purpose if you don't have that setting set, which typically is not set by default. And let's look at it. If I have to find somewhere, I should have. So let me go program files, Microsoft Data Center, number 10, service. And then, hmm. Let's open the server. Oh, okay. No, not this. Open the file I was saying. Okay. So here is that file look like the custom setting file. Um, and with business center 21 and higher, you don't have access to the admin panel. So that becomes a, a lot more work for developers or, or you know to kind of keep updating this file. And then remember the properties, which is public URL, not the source one web page URL. So if that setting is set to default, which is this setting, if it is set to true, then system will try to read this path, whatever is set here, and then will try to run or publish your app or start your debugging session. One note to Microsoft, if somebody is listening to it later, please update this documentation uh, because uh, it removed this first to, start, to begin with because it is invalid. Second, at least correct it because this never works as it is. You have to change it to say your target host, your port number on your website, and then your service name. If you try this, which is the legacy old RTC URL help, it'll never work. Coming back to what we were talking about, if this is set to true, which is by default it is true, the system tries to launch the client based on this URL. And in case of debugging or publish, which you will have to update manually. If you don't want to get into that hassle, you can just change it to false. And then the VS code will remember and utilize this setting to launch your client. 
hope that makes sense. Anything else before we leave from today? Or any other topic that you would suggest for next week? And Jinmesh, go ahead. So one thing uh, we have faced uh, issue one for one client that uh, client would like to export the date format in a config package like YYYYMMDD. Is it possible? Uh, we can set up a format on the config package exported data. Config package data. Hmm. I don't think so, but. But is it related to a record or is it just a data from a table? It is just a data from, from a table. In last Sorry. week uh, we have talked already, but uh, we have tried one thing, uh, multiple region and all this. Mm -hmm. Is this something you have come across like last week to till now? Any standard field? Yeah, I'm looking at that. Uh, there should be data type field in customers. Yeah. There should be a last bit modified or something like that. Um, Check, clear, included. And then do a last date modified, modified date, include this field. And okay, let's remove the filter and then let's apply filter on. I can't do a filter. What? That's weird. Hmm. Okay, last date modified. Now this is a relation table number, relation field number, nothing here. And then here, open up included field two. You have to put the filter out there if you want to put a filter on in a king oh. package. Okay. If you close this, it's right there. See it next to fields. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't think I can do a date setting here anywhere. Created important date. Processing rules. Okay, what are those? Action oh, custom. Yeah, that. C custom yeah. is you, you have a custom code unit. Um, and I think these are I'm not positive, but I think these are used on imports. Oh, you okay. know, you know, like you can have your you can set. I don't know, say you're bringing in some invoices or something, you can set it, set them to post automatically after you, as you import them. Oh, that's nice. Hmm. Say data, 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 errors, yeah. Hmm. Right. The only thing I could think is if there's a way, you know, if you change the date format, but I don't know if it would include year, all four di uh, digits for the year. Uh, yes, that might make sense. But uh, Jignesh, is that SaaS or on-prem customers? On-prem. In on-prem, as Dan is suggesting, I think that may work where you just uh, change the format on the service tier, not on client. Okay, because the data is processed at the service tier. So when you have to change anything, that will work based on whatever is setting on the service tier. To specify the old value that you want to map to the new value, the value is one based on the option list. Hmm. It's for imports as well. So like, just to give you a simple example, say you were importing trial balances with old gl accounts from another system you, mm -hmm. you can you can map it to the new gl accounts in here 
and it'll oh, replace okay. it'll it'll replace them you know so it's mapping old data to new data if you want you can put it in here and then you don't have to update you know your config packages if you're you know say oh, you're doing 30 nice. 36 months of financials or something like that so is what that's used for Good. Hmm. so jignesh for sure here is no option on the configuration package i think as Dan is suggesting maybe that's the only way where you go to the service tier, change that date format in that service tier, and then try to export using configuration package. Right. Or you know, you could use XML port. Obviously, that's takes some development, but yeah, that's for sure. And then how about this? That is this how the ACH thing happens. I forgot that name. Oh, the data exchange. Yeah, data exchange. Maybe that's that. Data, it's like data definition. Yeah. It's the middle one there. Yeah. Yeah, there's but definitely the settings. Yeah, there's definitely yeah. settings in there where you can alter the date format. Yeah, that that's for sure. But then it needs some code in it. Uh, format, file type, variable text, fixed text, JSON. Let's say variable text. Um, generic import, generic export. Uh, CSV tab, semicolon. CSV semicolon. No, comma separate. Comma, comma. Okay, that's okay. Commas, custom column generator, header line, and a tag, and this. And then where do you specify the table numbers and all? But then it doesn't tell you which table you are exporting for, right? That's, they should have brought that in that I can say, oh, I'm exporting customer table. <laughs> should have been great. Yeah, I'll only do it from the bank table. So yeah, this the only option designation in that case is XML code as Dan is suggesting, I guess. Or write a custom export to Excel because that, that's where you can surely specify the formatting of your date fields in the Excel exports. Okay, okay. There is a format parameter in Excel export. So that I'm pretty sure that Excel buffer still have that. But let's see. Okay. Uh, what is that? Write cell value. No, add add column or something. Add column. Yes. So there is is bold is italics is underlined number format. So here you can define your date format, and then the cell type becomes date. And in this, whatever the format that you need, you can specify that it'll convert that to that date format. This is a old trick in the book for this, I guess. Yeah, we know the uh, like we suggest the option to this like XML port, but client want to download from the package. Mm -hmm. That's why they don't want to create a new development. Then create an Excel. What is that? Ah, control add in for them, which converts that to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, as an yes, uh, as an configuration package. I mean, as an in the latest release, they did enhance. Uh, on the reports, you can define now uh, at the runtime what date format you want or what type of date you want. But that's just limited to remote, so reports and all. So I can say that, oh, my price list, but I'm a user in India. So I can come here and say in the advanced section that I would like to see it based on my end. Yeah. And uh, language will not support unless you have a language installed and all. But then I can do a preview. Oh, okay. It needs a customer. Okay. Okay. Oh, my name is that. Okay. A preview. We'll make sure that it supports the regional date time format and the numbers come in that language. This does oh, so it does not understand India here. 
So that broke here. But if you would have understood that, I'll convert that date and that number uh, decimal separators and all based on the region that you are in. But I guess you need to have supported language in there. So I don't know what US region uses a different language, but I'm pretty sure that can be chosen from here. I mean, it's Australia, what happens with that? It still says Saturday, 15 April. And what if I don't do anything? <clears throat> well, maybe Australia and US use the same format for the dates and all. But that is the only thing that where Microsoft let you change it at the runtime, the date format, the time format, and the uh, decimal separator based on the region where you are in. And this feature you can enable on the report settings also for a particular report so that you don't have to come and change it every time. But that's all I guess on this one at this point. I uh, don't think it does support any other major countries. If I do India, I guess it failed. Yeah, it did fail with converting that into Indian language because that module is not installed here at this point. Okay, anything else, anyone? Okay, so if you guys have any thoughts for the next week, let me know somewhere uh, and we'll prepare for that. Otherwise, we'll see if we learn something new and talk about it. Thank you. Have a great day, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye.